Hi, welcome to my latest video. Well, this is sort of going to be a revisiting of some technology I've done in previous videos, maybe as long as a year and a half ago. And that is my Raspberry Pi 4 that I put into the special console case that puts all the connectors, by the way, because it redirects them through the side panel here to the back of it and makes it look really nifty from the front. Now, this particular unit is currently my backup domain controller for my home network. But I want to upgrade it. I want to upgrade it to the latest version of Ubuntu server. That's 20.04 for the long-term support version of it, which is being fully released and supported if I choose to do so. In addition, it'll go from a 32 gig SD card to a 64 gig card so that I have some more space on there to do some things that I started running out of space on. So what I'll do is we'll start off by building the Raspberry Pi with Ubuntu 20.04. I'll pull out this guy's SD card, which is a 32 gig one, and then I'll put a 64 version in it. And we'll see how that all works. It should work fine. In addition to that, now that I have a switch that is running with PoE on my network, I want to have this use PoE rather than have a separate brick supplying five volts to it. So what I did is I purchased a PoE splitter. And this splitter will actually take the PoE out of the existing network cable that includes both data and power and split them into two separate things. One will be the network that will connect right to the back of the network connector on this Raspberry Pi 4. And the second one will be the power. So this is the actual adapter, the USB-C, that will plug right into the power connector on this. It should work fine, but we'll find out when I hook it all up. This may take two parts. I'm not sure yet, but we'll see. I'd like to you know, keep it so that it is bite-sized and people can follow it. But let's get into it and see how long it actually takes. Okay, if you'd like to have your own copy of Linux on a Raspberry Pi, you need to go to the Raspberry Pi website for software download, which can be found at this URL here. Once you get there, you scroll down, you see something called a downloader. Install the Raspberry Pi imager. And the imager can come in different flavors, either Windows, Mac OS, or Ubuntu itself. I want to be able to run this on my Windows PC, so that's what I'm going to download. So I'll click on that. It has now downloaded it. So let me go ahead and open the file and run it. And here it is, the actual creator of the media. Now you're going to need to have a micro SD card handy in order to create this. But the first thing we'll do is we'll select the actual OS that we want. Click on that, and I'll go to Other General Purpose OS. I'm interested in Ubuntu, and there are quite a few to choose from here. If you go down the list, the one that I want is the 64-bit of Ubuntu Server 20.04. So let's click on that. So now that's the operating system that we loaded, and I'm going to choose the media. I already have a 64 gigabyte micro SD installed on this computer, so I'll select that. And once that's done, now that I have the device actually plugged in to my PC, I'm going to do a write. It'll clear out all existing information from it. Am I sure? Yes. So now it's writing it. And then I'll speed ahead. Okay, it looks like it's all finished. Let me hit continue here, and it's initialized completely. So what I'll do next is I'll come down to the bottom and I will eject it. Oh, it's already ejected, so I can pull it right out. Now I can take this uh, micro SD card over to my Raspberry Pi 4 that's gonna be installed on, and we can start configuring it on there. Okay, now that I have the SD card installed into my Pi, I will power it on. It's now using, as I said before, the uh, PoE extractor. So let's see what happens here. Looks like it's coming on. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's booting up. This should take a little bit. A lot of stuff running in Linux. Now it's probably doing some automatic updates at this point, but I should be able to log in. So let me try that. The default account is called Ubuntu. And the password is Ubuntu. And the first thing it asked me to do is to change a password. One more time, I type in the default Ubuntu. It now wants a new password. I'll give it a secure password. It wants it a second time. And it's changed the password and it's logged us in. As you can see, right off the bat, we get a bunch of, you know, handy information after we log in. We are in command mode, which means there is no graphical user interface, although you could install it if you so desire. I will not do that to save resources. It does tell you how to run root commands using the sudo, S-U-D-O, for set system user 
And the first thing I'd probably want to do is to make sure that we have updated software. So I will do a sudo apt, which is a general updating application updating program. And I'm going to tell it to do an upgrade. We'll see what we get. It's now doing basic upgrade. Doesn't seem much configured to upgrade at this moment. Let me try. If I hit arrow up, I can get most of that back and I'll say update. That may hit a bit more. Looks like it is. This is going through and updating significantly more, it looks like. So this may take a while. On a fresh install of Ubuntu, it, uh, it's the common practice for it to take a while. Okay, it finished that part. Now, it looks like it has 43 packages that can be upgraded. So it gives you a command there to see what they are. So I will do it again, based upon what they wrote there. S-U-D-O, apt, list, and we're giving it the option, double dash, upgradable. So those 43 are upgradable. I am gonna now do upgrade again. I can just hour up to my previous command that said upgrade. There we go, we'll see what that does. And now it's upgrading them. This first one, I have to confirm it because it's going to use extra disk space. Hit yes. Every once in a while, you could get that prompt. Again, this could take a significant amount of time. Okay, it's telling us there's a newer kernel available, pending kernel upgrade. So you should consider rebooting. I'll say OK. Okay, it looks like we're all done at this point. It wants me to reboot so that it can load the new kernel. Let me do that. Sudo reboot. There we go. Okay, we're back to the login prompt again. Ubuntu, the league account I'm using. My new password is what I'll use here. And we're up. Let's see, does it have any updates? There are zero updates that can be applied immediately. So I think at this point we're good and I can move on to the next step. Well, the first major step in converting this Raspberry Pi in this fancy little console case into a server is done. The basic Ubuntu server operating system is fully installed. Now there are additional changes I'll be making to the operating system going forward. However, I want to show you before we do that, something that's actually very nifty. It's great when you're used to using the command line. If that's the way you live, and a lot of people do that way, I used to myself when I was a software developer, I didn't have much of a choice back then because the systems we were running just didn't have the resources to run a graphical user interface available at the time. But now we could actually load, if we wanted to, a graphical user interface on this, and it would work. Very similar to the Ubuntu workstation or desktop version of their software. It would work fine, but it would use a lot more of the memory and the SD card disk that this thing has. So it's a decision to make. However, there's something we can do in the middle. There is a very thin version of a remote access slash graphical user interface that's available in Ubuntu and is available for the version of Ubuntu that runs in the Raspberry Pi just like any other PC. And it's called Cockpit. So what I'm going to show you now is how to install and configure Cockpit. And then going forward, in future information that I show about turning this into a full-fledged server and additional changes I'll be doing, I'll be doing it through the Cockpit menu, at least partially. So let's go ahead and get started installing that and seeing how it works. You'll like it, so stick around. Before installing Cockpit, I recommend that you reset the root password. Now you did create a password to your root equivalent account, which we're currently logged in here, Ubuntu, when you first logged in. But I like to make sure I have the root set to something that I know properly. So let me go ahead and show you the command for that. You need to do sudo, S-U-D-O. The actual command is P-A-S-S-W-D. And then you give the account name that you want to change the password for. It now prompts you for a new password. So you set it to something that you feel comfortable with. Make it different than the password that you made for the account you normally use, however. That's a general a good practice. It'll ask you a second time, and it says password is successfully updated. So now another advantage to that is we can use the su command and become root as we do the remaining commands. I only recommend you do this when you have a lot of root commands that you have to do so that you don't have to type sudo every time. I do that only when I have a large number. So I'll do su, which defaults to root. It's going to ask me for that same password. And now it changes the prompt from a dollar sign to a pound sign. Whenever you see the pound sign, you are as the root account. So the next thing we would do to establish cockpit is let's double check what our IP address is, just in case you did not catch it when you first logged in. 
It is displayed when you do that. But if you want to see it at any time, you type in IP space ADDR show. And now the interface that we're using is ETH0. And you'll see that it has currently in this little system an INET of 172.16.1.125 slash 24. So that means just a standard class C address range. And this is dot .125 within that range. Now, in a future video, I will show you how to change that to a fixed static address, which is the proper thing to do with all servers. But for now, let's leave that. Installing Cockpit, we then want to install the actual Cockpit application. Now, it may already be installed but let's go ahead and see. If we type apt install cockpit and it went ahead and installed it. But notice something, it says suggested other packages. Keep that in mind, you have a cockpit-doc, cockpit-pcp, cockpit slash, and a whole slew of them that'll be installed along the way. Do I want to continue because it's going to use some disk space to install this 21.8 megabytes? I will say yes. And now it's installing cockpit. So it wasn't installed, and now it will be once this command has completed. And we're done. So it's pretty quick. Now it is installed, but it is not set to actually function as a running background process. To do that, I have to use another command to establish it as a background process under a service called systemctl. So what I will now do is type systemctl enable the special option dash dash now so we don't have to reboot it. And what I want to enable is the socket for cockpit. Cockpit dot socket. And let's hit enter on that and see if it enables it. Okay, no errors. So that means the cockpit daemon is now running. So now I'm going to switch over to a regular window on my main PC and I'm going to remote into that cockpit. Okay, now I'm actually on a regular browser on a PC in the same network as my new Raspberry Pi server. Go to the address that was displayed by the server, and that is https forward slash forward slash 172.16.1.125 colon 9090. Let's see what that gets us. It's given us a warning that it's trying to connect to something that's not secure, but it's on my own network, so I will go to advanced and then click on the option to connect directly to it, even though it's unsafe. Now I have a login from the Ubuntu cockpit, and I can log on here with my regular credentials. I will type in Ubuntu, and I'll use my password, and I am now accessed. Now it says that I am not running as administrator. If I want to turn on administrative privileges, I've got to click here. You now have administrative access. Okay, good. Now there's a lot of things to see here and I'm not going to go through everything, but I'm going to do a quick scan. So under overview is what we're shown by default. I can actually look at logs and see what errors we've had since I you know, last established and turned on cockpit. I can take a look at my storage and see how much storage space I have here and how it's being used in terms of reading and writing and total usage. I can go to networking and I can see my interfaces that represent the network. The actual interface that has the address that I'm connected to is called ETH0, as I said earlier. There's a lot of information about the logs related to that interface. I can look at my accounts. Right now I only have two accounts on it. Ubuntu, which is my account that I'm logged in as, and root. I can take a look at services, what services are running. And this is a list of all the services, and it shows even errors that have occurred. So basically, this allows me to manage my Ubuntu server remotely with a very, very low level of resource usage on the server itself. Well, we can look at applications, but the thing that I'm going to use going forward in the part two of this video, since this will conclude part one, is the terminal. And in the terminal, I actually can do commands right onto the Ubuntu server. So I can do things like, where am I, PWD. I can do all sorts of man line options here to manage a system. And this is what I'll use when we go to part two. So stay tuned for that.